baby boy who's come to earth to bring us joy and I just want to sing this song to you it goes like this the fourth the fifth the minor fall the major lift with every breath I'm singing hallelujah 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 a couple came to Bethlehem expecting child they searched the inn to find a place for you were coming soon there was no room for them to stay so in a minute As the angel said, you'll find him in a manger bed, Emmanuel and Savior, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The place at which you were, the frankincense and golden myrrh, they gave to you and cried out, Hallelujah! 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 Rescue me, this baby boy would grow to be a man in one day die for me and you. My sins would drive the nails in you. That rugged cross was my cross too. Still every breath you drew was hallelujah. It's the last day of 2023. You're in the house of the Lord. You just sung about his praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We were the beggars. We were the prisoners. That can be in the message today, by the way, in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. 
But before we get to this idea that's uh, going to be the preeminent thought for today's message, I want just to stop for a moment, and I want to praise. Um, when a pastor uh, is teaching and preaching, he's always looking for illustration, object lessons, and demonstrations of Scripture. And when it's right in your own congregation, there's nothing greater more thrilling to a pastor than this. And so you see today's message title, Adoption, the Love of God in Action. And that's really the pivotal verse in all of Galatians. In chapter 4, it mentions the adoptions as heirs and adoptions as sons and daughters of God. And what an amazing picture we have today in the adoption of serenity into the family of Eric and Alexa Fritz here today. And so um, I want to ask the family if they would come down and Serenity would come down. We've been knowing Eric and Alexa since the pandemic, um, 2020, uh, when they first started coming to Lake Forest. And in that time, uh, we've come to know uh, Serenity here. And so Serenity came shortly after that, and she's grown a lot since she's been here with us. And the relationship between Eric and Alexa and Serenity has grown very much to the point that December 19th, uh, the adoption was finalized of young Serenity into the Fritz family. And so I, I just want to take this moment right now to recognize the adoption, but also recognize the love of God in action in an adoption to take one into one's own family to love and to cherish and to hold and to care for shows the love of God working in Alexa and also Eric but also in serenity uh, adoption comes with privilege and adoption comes with benefits and that's the love of God being shared shared with this little one each and every day we've had times to talk serenity and I and and every now and then she'll come into the office. And even this morning she came into the office. And uh, recently, last year, she made me custodian of the lollipop jar. <laughs> and uh, every now and then when she comes in, she'll, she'll ask and she'll leave a deposit for the lollipop when she leaves. And says, Pastor, uh, this is my, my offering today. And so without a deposit... You know, we do it by grace, just like the adoption that God gives us. We, we don't make a deposit for adoption, our adoption into the family. And neither did Serenity make a deposit in her adoption process and her journey to become a part of the family of Eric and Alexa. And so today, we just want to take a few brief moments and celebrate with this family uh, the, the adoption of a young one and the demonstration and illustration of God's love working in all three of their hearts to make this come to pass because this is really an election of all three, not just one, two, but all three. And so would you give these folks a hand for the love of God in this thing? Now, we'll also have a little card, my dear. If you would for serenity we'd like to give serenity a card to remember this day but also what's what's a celebration without a balloon right and what's a celebration without sweets and so we we know there's nothing better those of you who are grandparents know there's nothing better than grandparents because you get to juice them up and send them home. And so that's the role that I'm, fi I'm, I'm filling today as grandparent and pastor. And uh, you just look at that little cake right there. That is something else. And if, if, if you can talk somebody into it on your way over to the other building, or if you stay here today, we want you to enjoy these. And remember today always, as we love your parents and also you, and th what love that you have, we would like to share in that with you. And that doesn't mean that I get a cupcake. That just means that we love you, okay? Okay, again, one more time. Oh. How come Dad took the biggest cupcake? <laughs> Those of you who were here last year and 
uh, beginning in January, know that I began a series teaching through Galatians last year. And in May 7th, I was in this section of Scripture for two weeks. No surprise, right? 11 verses. <laughs> um, I was in this passage for two weeks, and today it will be a little bit of a recap of that, but also it will be an application toward what we have just witnessed in the life of Eric Lexa and also serenity. Uh, I, I, I want to give you six stupendous pictures or examples or benefits of adoption. Make, make God's adoption, the love of God in action. Six stupendous benefits. And here they are. The position. We start with the negative. The position of the, neg and the naturally born. Number two, the power over the naturally born. These are truths. The position of the naturally born, the power over the naturally born. Finally, the number three, the pivot point here, the position of those who are supernaturally born. So you have the naturally born and you have the supernaturally born. The position of the supernaturally born. And then the power of grace. Number four would be the power of grace. Number five, the passion of God's grace. You know, God just doesn't wait for us to feel like receiving grace, but the passion of God's grace is a pursuing grace. God moves forward, moves toward us, even when we turn away from him God is continually moving toward us and number six the peril of misunderstanding God's grace the peril of misunderstanding God's grace so you have the position of naturally born the power over the naturally born the position of those who are supernaturally born the power of grace the passion of God's grace and the peril of misunderstanding God's grace and so I'm not going to read through all the passage today. I'm going to go through each one of these things, and I'm going to highlight each verse what it has. But first, we need to take a trip. We need to take a trip. Like I did last May and April, I said we need to understand this letter in the context in which it was written and the people who received it lived in day in and day out. And so I want you to get into your mental time machine with me and go back to the time that Paul was writing, which was approximately 49 A.D., and, 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 and understand what adoption meant in that day. Adoption in that day... To the audience that this letter was originally written to, they were written to the Gentiles in Galatia who were immersed in Greco-Roman culture for centuries. Adoption to these people was a very technical word, and it was also a, a word that meant to place a son. That's literally what the word in Greek means, to place a son. It was very patriarchal. And it, it had no reference to females whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it was so rare in antiquity that a female would be adopted that it's hardly even mentioned in any of the ancient writings that we have today. But to place a son was an honor because to place a son was to place a son in a position to be what's called the patria familias, meaning the father of the household. And see, and in that day, in, in Greco-Roman culture, one had to have a leader in the family, which was always the father, and the father was the accountant, the bookkeeper, the wage earner, and also the spiritual leader in the family. And being in the Greco-Roman culture, that could mean worshiping a number of gods or specific gods that were known to clans or particular families and so he formed really the ultimate authority in all of family life such that there was a phrase that was understood which was the patria potentius patria potentius meaning that the father had ultimate power in the family 
And that meant that the father in Greco-Roman culture could disown a naturally born son, could adopt another son from outside of the family and dispossess the naturally born son, even if he was still in the, own, the same household. He could take the, the position of patrius familius, meaning the father of the household, and supplant even a naturally born son. And so when we talk about adoption in the Greco-Roman culture in which this letter was written, it was a very formal, it was very patriarchal, and it had a plan behind it to succeed the father of the house. In this adoption, it was so uh, prestigious that usually it was only the rich that practiced this. Now, you know that in, in, in Rome... They had these guys at the top of the food chain in the political hierarchy called Caesars. You know, there was really no fella named Caesar, no, no king or a prince that was named Caesar. They had a name, but they called him Caesar, like as in Caesar Augustus or Caesar Tiberius. Basically, we might think of that as, as the king or the president. So, so prestigious was this idea of adoption that it, when we look at the history of the Roman Empire, of all, all, of all the, the Caesars that were there, there's an incredible number of Caesars that were actually adopted sons. So, for example, when you look at the name or you hear the name Julius Caesar, most of you probably have some name recognition with this fellow. Well, Julius Caesar had no children, had no sons. And the sons were the only ones that were allowed to ascend and take the patrius familius. So Julius Caesar adopted a, 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 a son named Tiberius, which became after him Caesar, Tiberius Caesar. And as a matter of fact, Augustus Caesar was also an adopted in the line of Tiberius. And so we have of nine of 12 Roman Caesars were actually adopted sons. Now you think about that. That is some power. That is upward mobility in action when it comes to socioeconomic and political influences to be someone who is down here on the social strata, adopted into a family and, is, and become the president, let's just say, of the United States, for example. That's quite impressive. And so when, the, when, when Paul is using this, he has got all of these ideas in the background. And when he gets to the verse where it says, we are adopted as sons and heirs, that's the idea that he is carrying into this text for his readers to understand. The gravity of God's adoption, God's love in action through adoption is immense. It has consequence, it has weight, it has gravity to it. And that's the thing that we need to understand when we begin to look at these verses, verse by verse, verses 1 through 11. And so turn with me in your copy of God's words, and let's, let's think about, let's consider the position of all those who are naturally born. Paul begins in chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, and he says this to his readers, and he says this to us today, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave. Although he is owner of everything, he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of this world. Paul is saying to his readers, and I am saying to you as if I were Paul today, that the elemental things of this world, meaning the social norms, the customs, the morals, the mores, uh, the philosophies of the age, the ideologies of prevalent in society, were actually elements of a slavery or an imposed slavery upon all those who were underneath those systems. He is saying that even to the Jew, that the law was a mechanism of bondage to slavery. 
He is saying to the Gentiles who were out the law, your social dictums, your mores, your customs, your, your tribal, whatever they might have been, they were actually elements of shackles and chains on you to enslave you and keep you impoverished. He's not saying, as some would say today, as the antinomia, meaning Latin for no law, he's not saying let's do away with the law and then everything goes. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying that the law, in particular, the moral law of God, which is imprinted on every single human being ever born after Adam and Eve, the fingerprint, the thumbprint, if you will, of God, though even the moral law of God convicts and condemns and enslaves Every single human being after the likeness of Adam and Eve. That's the condition. That's the position of every single naturally born human being on planet Earth. In verse 8, he continues and he says, however, at that time when you did not know God. So even if you don't know God. Even if you do know God, you were slaves to those things which are by nature not or no gods. How many of you ever got to a point in life when you just got tired of making rules? It seemed like keeping the rules was hard enough. But when you make rule after rule after rule after rule after rule... It seems like it is just about impossible to remember the rules, much less keep the rules. Paul is writing to Galatians who had accepted the freedom of liberty in Christ through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has basically said to them in the first three chapters, why are you going back to this old system of law and rule keeping? To holidays and Different days and customs and traditions and, and, and listening to these folks that have come behind me calling themselves from the mother church at Jerusalem. He says, why are you going back to slavery? And so it's not only the people that are naturally born. It's the people that sometimes can be supernaturally born that can be duped into going right back into legalism, for example. And so we here are... are told that the natural born state is a status of imprisonment and slavery to the elemental things or principles of the world now let's consider number two the power over all of those are natural we mentioned the elemental principles or things it could be the philosophy of the age the cultural norms the traditions the mores of a society a clan or a tribe All of these things. And it could even be, as Paul says, that we were under managers and custodians. It could be structures, whether it be in the family or outside the family. You know, in that culture, it was very common for fathers not to have a lot to do with their sons, but they would entrust their sons to managers and custodians, which had two different different responsibilities. One was a strict disciplinarian. And the other taught the customs of the day. And the power of these two rested in the patria familias. His absolute authority. The father of the family instilled the power into these managers and custodians. And so much so that the patria familias could allow or order that son's death. If he was not pleasing. You know, I was doing some research about this. One of the reasons why it was so important to have a son, and many sons in many cases, is that the infant mortality rate in ancient Rome around this time was anywhere from 15 to 35 percent. And so just because you had a son, an infant, didn't mean that he would make it to three or four. As a matter matter of fact, there was good odds that you wouldn't make it the 40 in that day and so it made having a son that would be quality material for to be rise up and be the patria familias even more important and the father's power 
in that, in that household, in that family, was the structure, was, was the ump, so to speak, that gave the authority to all of the structures like managers and guardians. You know, there's a phrase that was popularized a number of years ago, which I really hate. There's some merit to it. I, I get it. But there was a phrase that was popularized in, in, a, uh, in a political campaign. It went like this. It takes a... What's that? Village. village. That's right. I don't know if I want the village in my business. And the father didn't either. The father didn't want it either. You go back and you study in, in the times of the Greeks, and you find out that Philip of Macedon, which is uh, the father of Alexander the Great, you find out who was, who was sent to study with and train, and you find out that you have Socrates and you have Plato and you have all these major characters in, 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 Greco, uh, in, in Greek history that were the teachers of the day. Those are examples of the managers and the guardians that was instilled to teach and raise up great men to be the patria familius. And the patria potestis, the absolute power of the father, was the strength that held all these things together. Today, we do that to ourselves many times by structures in churches or other organizations or government. We allow them to have certain power over us. And sometimes that gets to be overburdensome, does it not? And this is what we're talking about, the power over all who are naturally born. We are in this world, this sinful world, where there's cravings and desires for greed and money and lust. And they will come in and they will take over whatever territory that we're willing to grant them. Now let's look at the position of those who are supernaturally born. Paul continues on in verse 4 through 6, writing these words. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that we might, or that he might, redeem those who are under the law. That law is capital L in the New American Standard. He's writing to those who are going, fading back to Judaism from the gospel of freedom and liberty. He's writing that to redeem those who are under law that we might receive the adoption as sons. There's your word, adoption. That's the pivot point today, adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit into his son or of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Here's the contrast. In, in the naturally born, you are enslaved. In the supernaturally born, you have been freed, but not only have you been freed from the slavery of the law, the dictums, the customs, the elemental principles of this world, but you have a new father. You see, in adoption, you have a new father. Serenity has a new father and a new mother, legally, today, because of that process. Now, in the heartstrings, that's been a long time. She's had a father and mother for a long time. And your father, if he be your father, has desired you for a long time too. Before the foundation of the world, before there was a world created, he knew you and he desired a relationship with you. And many people that you know all around you, he desired. Peter says that he's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance, meaning salvation. Paul writes in Ephesians, says he predestined us before the foundation of the world. Meaning, before time began, don't get me started into that. But it's what it says. You have a new father, but not only do you have a new father. Jesus, when he was leaving the disciples, told them about even something better. You have not only a new father, but you have a permanent companion. You have a permanent companion in the person in the work of the Spirit of Christ, or otherwise known as the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit who's also called the teacher. You have the Holy Spirit who's also called the comforter. And it says, whereby we cry, 
Abba, Father. He, God sent forth the Spirit of His Son, Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's a term of endearment there. You didn't run up to call anybody just Abba, Father, either in Greek or Jewish culture. And no Jew, no self-respecting Jew in Judaism would ever call God his Father. But here, Paul is saying, not only do you get to call him father, but literally you get to say, daddy, daddy. A term of intimacy. Jesus said it like this, but the helper, he called him, Jesus called the Holy Spirit the helper. The helper, the prolocratos, prolocratos, try to say that three times. The one who comes alongside is what that literally means. <laughs> The one who comes alongside. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans, John 14, 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus also said, I, I, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and he will bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. He's speaking to the disciples, of course. But he's saying that I'm going to send one like me to be with you and to be with you permanently. Not like Joshua in the Old Testament. Not like Samson in the Old Testament. Remember, Samson arose and he says, I will, free, I will free myself from the Philistines as I have before. And the scripture gives a commentary there that says, He did not know that the Spirit had left him. As, as those who are supernaturally born, we are given, we receive, and he never leaves the Holy Spirit. And not only that... It says in Ephesians that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Our relationship is sealed. It's cemented much like an adoption contract. When it's signed, it's a legitimate, irrevocable contract that says this has been done. It's a mark or a seal. Jesus, inspiring Paul to write through the Holy Spirit, said you are sealed until the day of redemption, meaning the day that you see him face to face then literally you become his. And so that, that's the position of those who are supernaturally born. Now the power of the grace, the power of God's grace, it keeps on giving. It gets better than that. Grace makes you a joint heir with Jesus. Not only have you been adopted into the family, It's so unfortunate that we as Christians do not understand the depth of God's grace and his love when he adopts us into his family. For some of us, perhaps serenity, for some of us is easily recognizable, that mark of permanence and stability, that promise of faithfulness and acceptance, unconditional acceptance. But for some of us, me included here recently, the power of being part of a family is mind-blowing. Not, not just to be part of a family, to be, be joint heirs together with Jesus, Paul says. Grace makes you not only a son or a daughter of God, not only welcomes you into a family, irrevocable. That was adoption in Greco-Roman was irrevocable. It was permanent. When Julius Caesar uh, 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 adopted Augustus and then Augustus adopted Tiberius, the Senate, the Roman Senate, had to put their stamp of approval on it. And it was irrevocable. And God's adoption of you, like serenity, is an irrevocable legal proceeding. And God's court and God's clerk stamps it with the, with the Holy Spirit 
as irrevocable. You are made not only a son or a daughter, but a joint heir with Jesus. I wonder if we really understand what that means. Last week, the last verse of Isaiah 53, it said something like this. I don't believe I wrote it down here. Oh, yeah, I did. It says, therefore, God speaking here about his son, the sacrifice, the suffering servant, the sovereign servant. He says, therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Guess who that is? It's every single one who's been adopted into God's family. It goes on and he says this, because he poured out himself to death and he was numbered with the transgressors and yet, yet he poured out and bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. He interceded for the naturally born to set them free, to give them a father, to give them an adoption, to give them an heirship with him, meaning to be an heir together with Jesus. Paul, right in the Ephesians church, said it in chapter 3, verse 6, he says, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers in the promise of Jesus Christ through the gospel. The gospel is God's acts, God's love in action. And when he brings you into the family, not only do you have him as a new father, the heavenly father, you have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, and you also have everything that Jesus will get one day. You will be an heir together with him. In other words, there's no second class, there's no coach class, there's no steerage class in this economy. There's no back of the bus or front of the bus. There's no first class, second class, third class post. But you've been an heir, been made an heir with Jesus through the adoption offered by the love of God, the grace of God, and the, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of grace that keeps on giving. It's God's love. You have a new father. You have a new companion, a new comforter, a new teacher. And the power is that it gets even better that because you're made an heir together with Jesus. Matter of fact, I wrote in my notes here, you are an heir of the father's estate. You are an heir of of the father's estate. You know, in, in Greco-Roman culture, that was the primary reason for adoption, to gain a new patrius familius, the new leader, the new heir. And God does the same thing with us. There's also another benefit here that I haven't spoken about yet. When we're adopted into, uh, in, into God's family, there's a phrase in Latin called tabula rasa, does anybody know what tabula rasa is? There's one Latin student right down here. And I deal with this a lot. Now, it's hard to understand and hard to explain sometimes, so let me just make it very simple. Tabula rasa means, in English, blank slate. It's a term that could be used in accounting, for example. So when you have columns in accounting, and I know I have some bookkeepers here and some accountants and whatnot, and you understand when you keep a ledger, you always have a balance sheet. And whether you're in the red or the black. Red is not good, black is good. When you have a whole bunch of debits and you don't have a whole lot of income, then things are bad. Dr. Bennett used to say, when your upkeep exceeds your income, you know, it's going to be your downfall. But when you talk about this term, tabula rasa, how it applies to adoption... God literally wipes your slate clean when he brings you into his family. Literally, any debt, any charge, any accusation is wiped clean from your record when you are adopted through the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 1017, which is a quote from Jeremiah 3134 in the Old Testament, says it this way. It says, and their sins and iniquities or lawlessness, 
I will not remember. I will not remember. And it's a double negative in Greek. It's translated in English, I will remember no more. It's really a double negative in Greek. I will not remember no more. You see, whatever it was from the natural state of your birth, whatever sin debt, whatever penalty, whatever uh, uh, charge that the devil might want to come lay accusation against you before him. And you remember Job, right? The devil came before God and said, look at him. Look at him. The accuser is always accusing you, accusing me. And God's grace gives you tabula rasa and wipes it all clean. But fourth place, for everyone that knows him, in particular, this is important, and the fourth point, point is the passion of God's grace. It always takes the initiative. God's passion makes him take the initiative. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Paul wrote to Romans, Romans 5.8. He says here, but when the fullness of time had come, when God decided that it was time, he sent his son to save me and to save you. And not only that, Scripture tells us that no one can come to God. Jesus literally said this, no one can come to me, meaning Jesus, Unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so God is always taking the first steps toward you and I. And so it's not a static grace. It's an active grace. It's a grace that's in action because of his great love for us. Number five, the peril of misunderstanding adoption. Look there at verse 9. Verse 9b, the second half. How is it that you turn back to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored in vain. Paul, Paul is, is talking here to folks that have supposedly accepted Jesus Christ and the liberty and freedom from the bondage of the elemental things. But the peril of it is, is that our world, our enemy, Satan, would want to entangle us and trap us into believing that we still have to work for something in order to be adopted into God's family, to be acceptable, even if we have been adopted, to maintain our right standing before God, when the, the truth of the matter is none of that is true at all. We've literally, the picture in John 15 is we've literally been grafted into the vine and now we live on what God, through the vine, supplies us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's permanent. And so the peril is illustrated by the Galatians, and he's illustrated by the systems of which we create that create legalism, formalism, and traditions that choke the literal life out of us. Summary, four facts that I want you to remember today. You have a new father through adoption. You are an heir of the father's estate, number two. Number three, and in the adoption, all your previous debt has been wiped away. And number four, never forget this, the purchase price for your adoption was immense. It was God's son's blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We could sing that all day long. But do you get it? Where are you 
in that. Jesus paid it all. Go to another song. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe, right? It's permanent. And the picture we see today is very much parallel to this. It's love and action that created adoption. It's grace that keeps on giving. It's grace that keeps on pursuing. It's, it's the gospel in action in what we've seen before us today. There's one other thing to say. There's a Roman serial, Syrian law book that this quote is in. And it says, remember this, there's security. This parallels the scripture. A man cannot disown an adopted son. End quote. Jesus said it like this. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. We get tripped up sometimes into thinking that we have a performance to keep up. A standard to maintain. He knows we're going to fail. And just like Eric and Alexa know that serenity is going to fail. Our father continues to pursue and to love us in spite of these things. I can't think of anything better to remember in 2023 and take forward into 2024. When you look at your family, your friends, and when you reflect about yourself, that God loves you that much to make you an heir with Jesus. I'm not sure how the message spoke with you today. I know I've gone a little bit long. I apologize. We're going to have an invitation hymn today. I'll be down front as normal. If the Spirit moves you to come down front to talk about anything, about this message today, about church membership, what it means to be a Christian, you please just be obedient to do as the Lord leads you today. Otherwise, reflect on what it means to be adopted as a joint heir with Jesus through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we all stand?